In April of 2005, Ginny lost her daughter, Cody Diruff, to CF at the age of 23. Cody had asked her family to help others with cystic fibrosis to understand that CF was about living and not dying. Thus, the Cody Dira Fa Benefit Foundation was born. The foundation helps those with CF with out-of-area travel expenses, insurance deductibles, and out-of-pocket medical expenses, offers a fitness program, and provides support to parents. The foundation shares hope with the families it serves that one day a cure will be found. Please give a warm welcome to Ginny Diruff, who will talk about adversity and hope. all these new gadgets. I don't know what to do with them. Um, thank you, CFRI, for including me in this support system. I appreciate it so much. And I'm here to tell you a very personal story, and it's my story, and I know we all have stories, and I hope that you can walk this journey with me as I tell it to you. And then when we're done, you can walk the journey with me out to the bar for a whiskey. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> so do you remember the very first time that you held your beautiful baby in your arms? I do. I can remember waking up when the nurse placed my baby in my arms, and I was overwhelmed with emotion. I was exhausted, and yet I was exhilarated at the same time. I have never felt such pure joy. That moment that they placed that baby in my arms was the most incredible moment of my life. And I remember the joys of her sleeping on my lap. And as she grew older, she would wrap her arms around my thighs and my waist. She'd put her head into my neck for cuddles. And I remember her slipping her little hands into mine when we went for a walk. And she had a lot of firsts, and her first words were mama. Her first steps, the realization that she could ride a bike. The first day that she went to kindergarten and she waved to me from the bus window. Stepping into her skis for her first run down a powdery mountain, her first crush, her first dance recital, her first day of college. You know, everyone has a hero in their life, and I'll bet everyone out here says they have one too. And mine was a little girl who grew up to be a person that gave me strength, that taught me how to stand in the moment. She taught me that there's beauty and blessings in all of the obstacles that life may present. And her name was Cody. And she was amazing. Her smile would light up a room. And her passion was not only visible, but it was undeniable. She was a dancer, a skier, a soccer player, a star pitcher on her softball team. You would never know with all of her joy that she struggled with asthma or a chronic illness. From a very early age, Cody had a cough. And the doctors first diagnosed her with exercise-induced asthma, and they suspected that she had allergies. That may have been a little bit of a challenge for Cody, but a few allergy shots and an antibiotic 
was not anything that she could not handle. And through one of our frequented visits, the doctor had suggested that we go to the lab for an additional test. So that afternoon, we were at the lab, and then I went home, and I was reading Cody's story, and my phone rang. Hello, this is the lab calling. May I please speak to Dr. Feist? Hmm. I knew I didn't want to wait all weekend for those results. I couldn't help myself. Yes. This is the doctor's office. You can give me those results, and I'll be sure the doctor gets them. I heard the words, and they cut right through me. Those words echoed in my mind, but I felt motionless. And then that knot in my stomach pinched me out of my numbness. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis? I looked over at Cody, and she was sifting through the pages of the book that I was reading to her with a smile on her face as she looked at the pictures. She was nine years old. We waited nine years to get this diagnosis. Nine years to get the correct diagnosis. Nine years we watched our daughter struggle with her health without a clue of the truth. Nine years of lung deterioration. We learned that at nine years old, she had already lost 25% of her lung capacity. At the CF Center in Denver, the doctor explained to Cody why she was feeling so sickly. And he explained it to her in a way that a nine-year-old could understand. He looked her directly in the eyes and spoke to her, and indirectly, he spoke to me. He said, don't listen to everything you hear about CF. Don't get online and believe everything you read. And he looked at me and he said, don't treat her any differently than you would your other child. And he told Cody, you can do anything you want that anything any other child can do. But of utmost importance, he said, keep up your dance. And Cody's spirits were high when she heard that. And mine were crumbling. When we left the doctor's office and I closed the door, she looked up at me and she said, did you hear what he said? He said, I can continue to dance. So she was very excited. And even with her positive attitude, she knew things were different. She knew when she went away to dance camps that she would have to stop midday and do treatments. She knew that the port that was under her skin on her chest was visible. She knew the stomach tube would protrude from her leotard as she danced. But she didn't care because that's how much she loved dance. Oftentimes she would cry and I would cry with her. But then we would talk about what the doctor has said about how she could do anything that she wanted and to just do it and that we would provide her the guidance that she needed. And we would help her become independent with this disease. I think her ability to see the beauty around her boosted her resolve. 
She taught me that beauty can be found in anything and everyone as long as you look at it from the right angle. Her first hospitalization was when she was 15 years old. But that was okay because as long as she could dance, she could get better. You know, I can remember pounding on her back and her chest to get all that gook out of her lungs. And I remember helping her pour her medicine into her nebulizer machine. I can remember how her eyes would flinch every time a needle would penetrate her skin. And I remember the x-rays showed cloudy when they should have showed clear. But I really remember when her little face would turn so red when they yelled, blow, 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 into that machine that measured her pulmonary function. And because of our limited resources, we drove 10 hours one way for hospitalizations in Denver. And on one of our trips, she said, Mom, I want to fill every minute every day with as much beauty as I can because I know that this body and these minutes are not forever. And by the time Cody turned 19, she had realized that she was getting very short-winded when she danced. She had set a goal that education was going to take over. And she said, cystic fibrosis may rob me of my body, but it will never rob me of my mind. And she chose Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, 700 miles away. In her journey, she wrote, I am living in the present and the future and thus, I'm conscious of what I want now and what I want later in life. I am simultaneously young and old. I'm approaching my old age. Cystic fibrosis is my old age. Cody's health declined rapidly the latter part of her junior, senior year in college. She said, I work so hard, but I get so sick. And the more difficult things become. But then in the next breath, she said, but then I'll have more victories, because one day I will get to breathe freely. I remember getting a call from the ICU. They told me that Cody was not well. We called her brother. He flew from Denver. When we got to the hospital, Cody was lying with a bunch of tubing and oxygen. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I knew you would make it, Mom. I held her hand that night. And every night, I met her friends from college. I met her teachers. There she was in this hospital room in respiratory failure, and yet she still managed to have a guinine smile on her face. And I smiled back at her, but my stomach was raw, and I was distraught. And I thought, gosh, is this it? And then, because I always believed she would get better, because she always did, every single time. But this time, she looked frail and thin, and she had bags under her eyes. 
Her little chest was pumping up and down in labor. My beautiful baby girl, so young and so brave, and yet so calm with all of the commotion that was going on. Fifteen days into the hospital stay, Cody's body went septic, and her kidneys shut down. Now, the reason she ended up in ICU was because she developed a cyst in her lungs, and it dilapidated her. The pain was so excruciating that trying to do treatments was almost impossible. Three days later, our family and our friends stood around her bedside holding hands. And I remember our brother, my brother, said, we are all here for you, Cody. We are here to say goodbye. It is time for you to go. And within seconds, her body lifted off the bed and fell back down with her last breath. And the doctors came running, and the beeping started, and the echoes, and the yelling, and all the beeping. And then there was complete silence. And my mind started to spin when I suddenly said, no. And I looked, and the nurse was taking out the tubing. And I said, no. I was here when you put them in. I will remove them. So I gently removed the IB tubing from her arm. I removed the mask from her face. And I twisted the three-inch tubing from her windpipe. And I laid on her bed. And I put my arm around her chest and my head next to hers and said, I love you, Cody. April 28th, 2005. She was 23. And then I felt lost, and I was angry. Angry because she had to suffer. Angry because it happened to her. Angry that she did not graduate from college. She was 11 days shy. Anger that she could not pursue her dance. Yeah, that was pure anger, I'd say. But you know what? The moment they placed that baby in my arms was the moment that she was mine, and I was hers. She's my daily inspiration today. She's the reason I'm standing up here on this stage. And back when Cody passed, I thought, maybe this is the challenge that I'm not sure I can handle. I was completely and utterly helpless and hopeless. In my darkest days, I truly had forgotten what beauty looked like or what joy felt like. I didn't want to face this Cody-less world. But I would always ask her, give me a sign. Let me know you're out there. And boy, did I get the signs. I'd go into a grocery store, and I would see her favorite foods. I'd get in my car and turn on the radio, and her song came on. And in our travels, when we were at the beach, somebody had written Cody in the sand and had a heart around it. 
And another time, I looked down, and there was a circle drawn in cement with the name Cody. And another time, I looked up and saw this big yellow sign. It said, Cody's Books. She is with me every day. And sometimes we interact in my dreams. When I look back and remember all of Cody's courage, I could not stop life. I couldn't give up to a world of nothingness. Cody wouldn't have wanted that. I rose above my sadness and I embodied all that I loved about her. She did not wear her disease on her sleeve. And somewhere down the road, I wasn't going to wear my loss on mine. With every cell in my body, with every ounce of energy that I have, I will honor her determination, her grace, and her courage. I will do everything that I can to help spread awareness of cystic fibrosis. I will try to find support for the families who need it. And we did establish our 503C, the Cody Deeriff Benefit Foundation. That is going to be a legacy of my lifetime. And you already know what we do because it was explained earlier. We're a small foundation with a big heart. We want to be there and support our families. But Montana needs all of us. We have only gotten into five counties. We need all of Montana. They need us. So if you or anybody know of people that you can refer me to, to get specific funding to help our Montana children and adults, please see me before the conference is over. You know, Cody didn't choose to have CF, but she certainly chose, chose how she was going to live her life. And that is a choice that we all have here. Together here tonight and moving forward, we have an opportunity to choose how we're going to show up in this battle of CF. Let's don't let it get past us. Together with courage and passion and positivity and hope, we can help everybody on this planet with CF. Together. That's how we're going to do it. I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny. What an amazing lady. Wow. Now, they said uh, we we're going to have a, a brief question and answer period. I don't know if we want to do that or not. Uh, if. <laughs> we just want to see if she's up for it. Are you up for it? All right. So we're going to have a brief 10-minute uh, question and answer period. Again, we ask that you limit your question to one question and also allow the volunteer to sanitize the microphone. And please use the microphone in the center of the room because we are recording this. So uh, step up to the microphone. Good 
Is this on? I'm not supposed to touch it, and I'm too tall for it. <laughs> My, I guess what really caught me, as someone whose daughter lives, you know, within an hour of Stanford where she receives care, and, you know, we, we're really spoiled here in the Bay Area. We have multiple CF centers. Can you not hear? I, that's, I, it's, it needs to, but I'll just squat. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. See, this is like, this is so many friends here. This is, <laughs> but what really struck me, what you're, and there are so many things, and I just really want to thank you for sharing your story that is just so deeply personal and so moving and also so inspiring. So I just really want to thank you again for, for sharing Cody's story and yours. Um, and one thing that really struck me, and I know it struck Isa, which she, I guess Isa had gone out to, um, was participating in an education day in Montana, and she came back to our conference committee saying, these families, you know, we're so used to here being close to our CF centers, we complain driving an hour in bad traffic, and here you have families who are flying hours to get to places. So can you just share a little bit of what it's like for families who are sort of the interior of the U.S. that are not close to major CF centers and what that means? Because I know you support many families to receive care. It, it is really difficult to live in a smaller community where the doctors really don't know that much about CF. Traveling was extremely difficult because my husband had to stay home to work or we'd have no money. And so Cody and I always drove. We really couldn't afford to fly. And that's why when we got the foundation, we had decided that we need to help these kids with their medical travel because I want them to be with the best place possible. But it's very difficult. We've even had to spend Christmas in the hospital. So you guys are really lucky if you live close to a cystic fibrosis center that can help you because we didn't have that. We had a satellite in Billings, but for hospitalizations, the hospital there just didn't know enough. So it, it was a difficult thing, um, but I will never, ever give that back because we bonded in such a special way through all of our talks. We could talk about anything. And so those of you who do have to travel, I would definitely take that opportunity with your child or children and open up the conversations and talk about the disease and talk about life in general, school, dating, anything, because we became very close over all of that. Did that answer? I echo Siri's comments. Thank you so much for speaking and for your courage to share Cody's story with all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Issa. Uh, I have a question about um, your, your son. Um, and I wonder if you can share with us how was he impacted by having a sister with CF and um, both uh, while she was with us and then after she has passed and then with the Cody Direct Foundation. Well. Our son's name was Levi, and he was five years older than Cody. So Cody was nine when she was diagnosed, and he's this typical teenager. He wanted to help her do everything he possibly could. He was so helpful with her. I can't even hardly remember a day that they fought. She, he would always help her with her homework, and <laughs> every single night, Cody would put a list of all these mathematical problems on the top of the stairs, so when he got home, he had to help her figure them out. And one night, she did it on the front, she did it on the back, and she added another page. And I can't imagine how exhausting that was just to do that much. And he got home, and he goes, oh, no, I can't stay up all night, I'm exhausted. And he got to the last page, and it said, April Fool. <laughs> But Levi wanted to offer a part of his lung for Cody, which was pretty brave. <laughs> pretty brave of him. They wouldn't let him do that. But he wanted to save her. <laughs> but it wouldn't happen. And then when Levi got married, 
He went to med school. Thank you for asking that question, Isa. He went away to med school. And they decided they were going to have a baby. And he, he's like, I guess if we're smart enough, we would get tested and make sure. We already knew that Levi did not have CF, but back then they never did really test him for the gene. And so they did the swab on him and his wife, myself and my husband, and her parents. And the swab came back as positive for CF on both Levi and his wife, Anne. So we were pretty shocked. So they went through the IVP, and we have two beautiful grandchildren, twins, and they're six years old. So it's been remarkable. Hi. Uh, I just wondered, you didn't mention her going on the uh, transplant list. Did she go on it or decide not to go on it? Okay. Um, she had a friend, Michael, who every time they were in the hospital, they would go out on the lawn and they would talk about having a double lung transplant. And both of them said no. We don't want to die twice. We're not going to do this. But as time went on and the sicker both of them got, they both had decided, yes, we do. We don't give up in this game. And we did our interview. We got on the list. But back then, it didn't matter how sick you were. You could have needed a transplant right away, but it didn't matter because you weren't number one on the list. And when we were in Oregon, when they put her on the breathing tube, the breathing machine, they had said, we know she's not anywhere close to the bottom of the list, but we're gonna send her to Seattle by flight. And her body had gone septic and her kidneys quit. And so that opportunity didn't happen, but then a lung may not have come along as well. And I'm so thankful for all of these kids now and these adults that now you don't have to be number one on the list. When you need a lung transplant, you get it, as long as there's a double lungs for you. So yeah, we did go on the list. The opportunity wasn't there. We don't have the opportunity today with all of these that, that then that we have today. But even that, given that, I, I we still believe in hope and believe that all of our kids and our foundation are gonna get better and they're gonna get well. So the double lung transplant, yes, but she wasn't down on the list. Which is really sad because when you need a double lung transplant, you certainly need it, but she wasn't number one or two, she was nine. I'm all set. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> um, I am one of the fortunate people who lives in Bozeman, Montana and benefits from the foundation. Um, it makes a huge difference for each one of us with the costs and travel and support. We have a very supportive community that wouldn't happen without the Dura family in Coney's honor bringing us all together. So Ginny, how many people does the foundation serve? Well, <laughs> I never thought a number was important because every life is important. But currently we have 18, and that's just in our area, and you know how small Bozeman is. But every one that we can help is so rewarding to us. Everyone that we can sit and talk to and guide is so rewarding to us. And I just 
can't go by a number because if I had one, I would still have formed the Cody Dira Foundation. And in the years that I have known Ginny, our young people have grown up, gone to college, and I think graduated. Our first graduate was just this year. So I, I, I really can't say enough for our small community and people know about the foundation. You know, when I mentioned something about I call it Cody's Foundation. They go, yeah, I heard about that. So there's a lot of community support, but it would not happen without the place of love that came from Cody through her parents to all of us. So it's a public gratitude, Ginny. Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks, Laura. Once again, please thank Ginny. All right, before we